this at some point in your AP environmental class. It's a picture that was taken uh, in 1968, I think, and I remember that because that's the year I was born. But um, they, uh, it was the first picture ever taken of Earth, right? Because it was the first time we had gone out in outer space, and the astronauts turned back and took a snapshot of Earth, and it was like you could see it over the moon, and they called it Earthrise instead of moonrise or sunrise. And that is has been the most reproduced picture in the history of man, you know, because it was so, it was the first time people had seen our planet, you know, that's kind of cool. And that really did a lot to kind of motivate people to think about, you know, our planet looks really big, but it's really not that big when you're looking at, you know, the whole universe and all that stuff. And it's kind of weird to think that everything that has ever happened in humanity, you know, all the good, all the bad, it's happened to that little speck, you know. But um, anyway, it is a water planet. But 98% of the water on Earth is salt water, 97. Right? And then, uh, so 3% is fresh. But of that 3%, almost all of it's locked up in polar ice caps and glaciers. Less than 1% of the water on Earth is liquid fresh water. And you have to have liquid fresh water. So yes, we got a lot of water, but it's not all in the form that we can use, right? And plants have to have, and other animals have to have fresh water uh, like we do. And the problem is, is that, you know, our, our planet, I really think that AP Environmental or Environmental should be a required course in Alabama. We require biology to be the one science you have to take, you know, and then three other ones. Some states you have to take environmental science, and I wish we did it like that here. But the reason is because our, the human population on Earth, y'all may have already done human population, I don't know, but you know, for hundreds, you know, Homo sapiens have been around for about 150,000 years. And in that time, we were, small populations, right, scattered around the world. And then we get to just about 180, 200 years ago, and our population started doing this, and it's still doing that. And that, of course, was what? What happened? The Industrial Revolution, right? And so our human population is growing exponentially, um, and no species can continue to grow exponentially forever. It just can't. There's only so much resources, pollution begins to take its toll, diseases spread more rapidly, and all these things will eventually cause the population to slow down. Um, most of our growth is coming from the developing world, not the developed world. I always show a movie that's uh, um, called Population Paradox, and the paradox is you have some countries like Japan and Western Europe that are actually decreasing in population, and then you've got other countries like Mexico um, and some other South American and African countries and Middle Eastern countries that are exploding in population. So that's the uh, that's the paradox. And both have problems, right? Both have problems, just different problems. But anyway, the reason why I mention this is because the two largest countries by by population in the world are what? India, India <coughs> and China, right? And uh, that's that's important to remember because those are both considered to be developing countries. So they are both transitioning to become industrialized. And what that means is your their middle class is growing. They're going to be consuming more and more, which means more competition for resources with us, but also they're going to be polluting more. So, and you can't blame them for wanting our lifestyle, right? But the thing is, is that you don't have to have our lifestyle to pollute as much as Americans do. We're one of the worst in the world. In Western Europe, um, you know, they, they have our lifestyle. Some countries have a better, higher rated lifestyle, but pollute much less. There's a smart way and a dumb way to do things, and we're getting better, but we've got to continue to do better, and I tell my students all the time, my generation, generation older than me, kind of screwed things up. Y'all are going to have to change things, and I have great, great hope in what I see in, in y'all's generation. I really do. Y'all have an uh, open mind 
uh, more open than what my generation, the older generations had. But anyway, um, so water is a precious resource. And as our population continues to grow, then at plus the resource is not growing, you can see the issue there, right? Um, so uh, water has become a, a really big deal. Y'all may have heard of the Tri-State War, I don't know. But um, out west, they've been battling over, in the court systems, they've been battling over water for a long time because they don't have as much water as we do. Alabama has a lot of water. If you look at our state seal, our founding fathers of Alabama, when they decided, you know, what are they gonna put on the state seal? They put one thing, and that was our rivers because they knew that was one of our biggest national resources. I'm getting goosebumps. Because did y'all know that Alabama is ranked in the top five in biodiversity in all of the United States? We are number one in freshwater turtles. We're number one in crayfish. We're number one in freshwater mussels. There's, uh, we're number one in freshwater fish as far as number of different species. We're sitting on a gold mine. You know, we have so much biodiversity here in the state, and most of the people here don't even know it. You know, we're also in the top five in species extinction, however. So we got a lot to learn. We got a lot of work to do. But anyway, a lot of that biodiversity is because of our freshwater rivers. Um, and the Tri-State War I mentioned is basically the state of Florida and the state of Alabama versus Georgia because we share waterways, rivers and stuff. And so the rivers begin or start flowing through Georgia and then they course back and forth between Alabama and Georgia. They form the state line in a few places and then they may or may not go through Florida um, eventually. And so whoever's downstream gets less if whoever's upstream starts using more of the water, diverting it away for their own use. And that's what Georgia has been wanting to do, mainly because of Atlanta. And so we have been battling this out in the court system for a year, for decades, like at least 20 years. When I was working on my uh, graduate degree, um, that was one of the reports I had to write about was that. And it's still going on to this day. So this is kind of an interesting little story. So um, years ago, when uh, George W. Bush was president, uh, Sonny Perdue was the governor of Georgia, and he was this good old boy, whatever, and in Atlanta, their state legislator, legislature uh, passed it, or wanted to pass a bill that would restrict water usage and put in regulations like, you know, we got to start putting in low flow toilets and low flow um, uh, shower heads and things like that just to try to cut back on waste of water and when they said the low flow toilets like you can either you push this button uh, for you know number one and this button for number two you know and uh, that would save water because you don't need as much water to flush urine right so he made fun of it on the house floor, saying that the only good that will do is give your arm an extra workout here and end up pushing it twice, you know. And he laughed at it. So then, right after that, President Bush said, all right, you three governors of Florida, Alabama, Georgia, this is going nowhere in the court systems. Y'all come to D.C., sit down with an arbitrator, and just try to work this out amongst yourselves outside the court system. Just see if you can solve it. Solve the problem. So they went there, and they sat down with the arbitrator, and uh, the first question he went around to each of them, so the first thing he asked was, what is Georgia doing to conserve water? You want more water, which means less water for these guys, but what are you doing to make sure that you've done everything you can to not waste to begin with? And Sonny Purdue was like, uh, well, nothing really. Okay, what about you guys? Nothing. You know, because he said, y'all want more water. What are you doing to, you know, not waste the water you do have? Nothing. Well, Sonny Purdue went back to the state legislature that he had just made fun of for trying to pass that water conservation bill and said, guys, we got to pass the water conservation bill. And they're like, no crap. Yeah. So since then, the state of Georgia passed a water conservation bill. Florida passed a water conservation bill. Tennessee saw this happening. They passed a water conservation bill. And you know how we always say thank God for Mississippi because it keeps Alabama from being dead last? Mississippi passed a water conservation bill, right? 
Guess to this guess who to this day has not passed a water conservation bill? Yes. Alabama. And that is not smart. It is not smart because uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, who was at that time sitting on the Supreme Court bench, she saw, you know, the Supreme Court justices, they watch what's come working its way through the lower courts. Because if it gets up to them, they're going to have to argue or listen to arguments, and they've got to know about the facts beforehand. So they, they're studying up on this. Sandra Day O'Connor looked at them and said, or sent a message saying, if you do not have a water conservation plan, we will not even hear your argument. And so that's, you know, they're like, okay, let's do it. So last year, I had this guy, uh, Mitch, Mc, not Mitch, uh, Mitch Reed. He was the uh, lawyer for the Alabama River Alliance. I had him come and talk to um, our students at Bob Jones. And uh, he talked about the water conservation plan that is, has been proposed and sent to our governor and our state legislature for them to vote on. So they've already done all the work of putting this plan together. Now it's going to be up to us to call our legislators and say, we need a water conservation plan. This is where you can make a difference. Even if you don't vote, you can still write letters and emails and calls and all that stuff. And you'd be surprised what a difference you can make, seriously. If they don't hear from people, they're like, well, they don't care about this, and I don't either, right? They listen to their constituents who they represent. But anyway, um, and I, I, afterwards I asked him, I said, so where is this making its way up the court? How far away from the, are we from the Supreme Court? And he said, oh, it's there now. That it's waiting to be heard. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, you know, so where does that leave us? And he said, well, we're not a part of it. So what are you talking about? He said, it's Florida and Georgia. Florida asked Alabama to join them because we always have it's always been us in Florida versus Georgia and he said we turned them down and I was like because we don't have a water conservation plan he said well they didn't say that but that can be the only reason so it's stupid to, to not get a water conservation plan it's just so stupid but we have this fantastic okay I'm going on a roll sorry <laughs> but um, we have this this mindset here in the state of Alabama that don't tell me what to do. You know, even if it's good for us, don't tell me what to do. And we've got to get past that. You know, we've got to start watching out for our environment. If you don't give a crap about nature, it affects your human health and your kids' health and your grandkids' future health and all that stuff. So we need to care more. We really do. And you don't have to give up a, a, your lifestyle. It's just do things smarter, you know. Turn the water off when you're brushing your teeth so let it run the whole time. Or, um, I don't know, recycle. Or, you know, call a, call a representative and say, hey, you know, we need a water conservation plan. How's that working out? Y'all going to vote on that soon? Anyway, sorry about that. I got off. So, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through these real fast. Uh, but, um, I'm going to go back to the multiple choice questions because y'all haven't covered this and I want to present it first. Um, so I'm skipping forward. So water pollution, it can be chemical, biological, or a physical change in the water that can cause harm to living things. Um, and you know how I said you got to know the difference between primary and secondary air pollutants? You have to know the difference between a point source and a non-point source water pollution. So point source is basically where you know where the source is. You can point to it and say, well, that's where, that's where it's coming from right there. So if you have a pipe going into a water, like a sewage treatment plant, that's probably a point source. But the worst, the worst offenders is going to be non-point water pollution. Those are the ones that you can't really trace it to a single site. And examples, the number one cause of non-point source water pollution is runoff. When in doubt, answer runoff if it's a question about water pollution. Because if you don't know, just answer runoff. What is runoff? When it rains, the water runs off into the river, right? Well, the thing about water, y'all know it's the universal solvent, right? Y'all remember in chemistry, it's, uh, it's, it's H2O, that oxygen is sharing pairs of electrons with two hydrogen atoms, and those electrons aren't being shared equally. Oxygen, they tend to hang out, hang out more towards the oxygen end than the hydrogen end. 
So you get a slightly negative charge on the oxygen end, a slightly positive charge on the hydrogen end. They used to call it a bipolar molecule. Now that has another connotation. So now they just say it's a polar molecule, right? So anything with a charge will readily or easily dissolve in water. So it's the universal solvent, right? So many things will dissolve in water. So when it rains, some of that rain will infiltrate into the ground and then percolate downwards into the aquifers that are below ground. But a lot of it will just run off the surface following the pull of gravity. Right? and eventually into a stream, river, and maybe ocean. And so a lot of this stuff, like if you're uh, Walmart parking lots, your, your driveways, um, school parking lots, you all know how cars leak oil and Freon and all this other stuff. That stuff will be picked up and moved with the water and it goes straight into the Tennessee River eventually, right? We're in the Tennessee River watershed. And y'all do need to know what a watershed is. That's basically the area of land that drains into a particular body of water. So all the water that falls in Decatur, Alabama, is, if it doesn't go into the aquifers, it's going to run off into the Tennessee River, right? So we're in the Tennessee River watershed. Now since the Tennessee River dumps into the Mississippi River, we're also in the larger Mississippi uh, watershed, right? The Mississippi River watershed, or sometimes it's called a drainage basin, same thing, it, is, it drains two-thirds of the continental U.S. So anything that, uh, when you have nitrates and phosphates from agriculture, fertilizers, if they run off into the water, then that can end up going into the Mississippi River. If you have oil and grease, Tennessee, uh, Tennessee and the Mississippi River, uh, uh, pesticides, herbicides, runoff, all that stuff can run off. If it goes into Tennessee, then eventually it'll go into the Mississippi. And where does the Mississippi dump? Into the ocean. Into the ocean where? Gulf of Mexico. Gulf of Mexico, near New Orleans, right? And so <coughs> that is one of the reasons why you have a big, giant dead zone at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And that's because of a process called, you ready for this? Eutrophication. You ever heard it? Yes. Y'all know what eutrophication is? Y'all talked about it yet? Yes. You have? Excellent. So who can tell me what eutrophication is? Other than you. How are you? Let's answer all this. You said you knew it. No, I just like it. Who wants to take a shot at it? Let's look at the let's look at the breakdown of that word. <laughs> so E V U means true. TROF means food or, or nutrients. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this at you real fast and then I'll then I'll repeat it again because y'all do need to know this concept. Eutrophication, all right? So y'all know how farmers will apply fertilizers um, to their fields to help plants grow. And usually there are three main uh, things, chemicals, that are in that fertilizer because those are the the macronutrients that are usually not in abundance in the soil that plants need to grow. And those are NPK, 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 NPK. Nitrate, phosphate, and potassium, right? So if y'all have ever looked at miracle Grow, you know your moms may have plant food or a big bag of fertilizer you may put it on your lawn or if you know a farmer, he may put it on his field. It'll usually have a number, it'll have like three numbers, like 30, 30, 30, you know. That's the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus potassium. And a farmer, what he will do is go out there in his field and he'll have the soil analyzed and you know, you can buy varying uh, concentrations of each of these you may not need any nitrogen. So he may have one that's like 10 and then more of the phosphate and potassium or whatever. But 
these are these are the three that are most often in inorganic form in uh, fertilizers. They help plants grow. So he applies it to his field. Then there's a big rain. It washes out and into the Tennessee River. Well, in the Tennessee River, it's going to do the same thing for the algae that it did for his corn or soybean or cotton. It's going to cause a gigantic algal bloom. Now, that might be bad in that it could block the sun from plants that may be growing on the bottom or whatever. But the real problem is yet to come. Because that farmer can't afford, and it's not good for his plants, to put that to apply the fertilizer every day. He's not going to, it's expensive for one thing, right? Plus, he can actually farm the plants if you over fertilize. So he, he's not going to put it on there very often. So you have this one time big flood of nitrates and phosphates and potassium into the Tennessee River. You have this big algal bloom. They use all that uh, nutrient up. Now, there's nothing to keep them alive, so you have a massive die-off of algae. Well, that's not that bad, except anything that dies, whether it's in the water or on land, will be decomposed. And tip, a lot of times that's by aerobic bacteria. So aerobic bacteria use oxygen, just like we do when we eat. You're combusting that biscuit you just ate with oxygen, right? So do bacteria, aerobic bacteria. This is where the problem occurs. When the aerobic bacteria even involve the dead algae, that massive amount of algal bloom that died, they're sucking the oxygen out of the water, and this can happen overnight. It can very rapidly cause the O2 or the dissolved oxygen to plummet, and then that's gonna be bad for any animal, whether it's a worm and the mud on the bottom, or a fish, or you know anything. All the macroinvertebrates from the willow flies or whatever, all that stuff. You know? So that's what eutrophication is. It's when you have, and a lot of times they'll call it cultural eutrophication if it's caused by man. Oh, here's one. Let me tell y'all this. Y'all have got to know this word too. I screwed up my first year teaching AP environmental because I didn't tell my students this. So we have like weekly Latin quizzes in my class because a lot of times you can figure out a word and you can at least break it down into Greek and Latin roots and stuff. Yeah. So anthropos is a Greek word that means what? Human. Yeah, human. Like anthropology, study of man. It's talking about humans. G-E-N as in generator or genesis is to produce. So anthropogenic means caused by humans, right? So you'll see on the AP exam, they may say, what are some anthropogenic sources of greenhouse gases? Well, what would you put? What's the number one answer? Yeah, and, and where does it come from? <coughs> Burning fossil fuels, such as coal burning power plants. And by the way, did y'all, this floors me. It has slowed down a little bit, but in China, they were building, on average, one new coal burning power plant every year two weeks every two weeks now it's slowed down to like one per month you know but still that's because they're becoming industrialized and they need energy electricity for all their power plants and you know it's where is it going to come from coal although because they have such horrible air pollution in china um, the government there has started to really crack down and uh, y'all remember the, uh, Beige, the Olympics in Beijing? Remember that? It's cold for y'all. Yeah. Well, I don't know if y'all remember the background of what happened uh, leading up to it. They had to shut down industries in Beijing and limit the cars that could go into Beijing because the air pollution was so bad. Athletes from a lot of countries were saying, we're not competing. And it, did cl it cleared up a lot just in a short period of time just from doing that. You know, so anyway, um, oh, and by the way, another interesting thing that happened a year and a half ago, so y'all have heard of China's one-child policy, right? Well, guess what? They're phasing it out. They're phasing it out. So anyway, um, all right, so uh, 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 I got off a little bit. Sorry about that, but sometimes I hate just going slide by slide because as my wife calls it, death by PowerPoint. But um, anyway, so, so 
Runoff is the number one non-point source of pollution. It's the number one. Even in the oceans, if they, if they ask, what's the biggest source of oil in the ocean? Everybody wants to say oil spills. <coughs> Usually it's going to be the runoff, because that's constant every day, right? Um, but anyway, um, atmospheric deposition, that means acid rain, or acid snow, or acid uh, particulate matter. You know, you can't really point to any one source. Like, that's coming from all the cars and all the coal burning power plants. You can't, like, if you take some water samples and it's a little acidic, you don't know if where it came from her car. You know, she's doing it. You don't know. It's all the cars, you know. Um, all right. Do you have any questions about that? Sewage lines are often point because you, if you get fecal coliforms, a lot of times you can trace it back to a sewage chute plant. Although not always. Uh, every time it rains, and by the way, y'all might want to keep this in mind. Every time it rains, uh, the fecal coliform counts rocket uh, like a day or two after that big rain in Tennessee River. And that's because of all the cow, all the pastures, you know. Um, it eventually makes its way into the Tennessee River. But, uh, when I was y'all's age, I used to water ski and fish and all the swim in the Tennessee River all the time. And I used to get mad at my mom because whenever I'd get home, she'd make me put hydroperoxide in my ears and stuff. I was like, Mom, why not stupid? Uh, I'm so best. All right, um, so I've already said this. Uh, also, sedimentation. Y'all got to know what sedimentation is. This is a huge problem also. So. Okay, this is like one of the biggest things. This is another big, big, big thing, all right? These are big, big, big things that apes, uh, the college board loves to ask questions about. If, when you have plants and trees growing in the ground, whether it's a crop or, you know, a forest or whatever, you would not believe how much topsoil those roots are holding in place. It's amazing. And... They often have fungi associated with them that are living symbiotically, and that even does more to hold the topsoil in place. And so when you clear cut a forest, or if you let your field lie fallow, you know, nothing planting over, over the winter, it's just topsoil sitting there. So now if you have a big wind or a big rain, there goes your topsoil. And in Alabama, it can take anywhere from 500 to a thousand years to form one inch of topsoil. And then you can lose a ton in just one big rainfall event if you don't have roots holding in place. So you're starting to see farmers around here now have like a winter wheat or winter rye growing even in the winter time. And there's two reasons for that. They can get money for that or use it to feed an animal or whatever. And they're also saving their topsoil. Because guess what? If you don't have topsoil, you can't grow anything. Right? You have to have topsoil to grow crops or to have a forest or a grassland or whatever. And erosion will lead to sedimentation. So all that dirt and stuff that washes off, that's called sedimentation when it gets dumped into a creek or river. And the reason why they want to protect the, you know what a riparian zone is? So a riparian zone So like, let's say here is our Tennessee River. So this area on each side of it is called the riparian zone. And you want to protect the riparian zone because if you have grasses and bushes and trees growing there, then when the water runs off into it, it slows the water down. It gives more time for the roots to absorb excess water and trap sediment and even allows for the plants and the bacteria in the soil to uh, decompose and break down some of the pollutants. So it really cleans up the water before it goes into the stream or river. So we're trying to convince people now, uh, whether it's industry or a farmer who has cattle, put fencing up and only allow the cattle in a certain area of the, of the river because they'll trample all this. It turns to mud, you know. Um, or have a uh, dig out a place for the cows to go drink water away from the creek or stream, you know, so there are lots of things that you can do. Okay, anyway, um, y'all know what fecal coliforms are, by the way? 
So fecal coliforms are bacteria that are found in the intestines of mammals, including humans and cows and pigs. And so if you, and there's a way you can test specifically for them, and actually I used to work in Decatur. My first real job was at a company called Mid-South Testing. It's been sold now, but it's on Beltline. Um, they, it's an environmental testing company. Uh, they may be ETS now or something, I can't remember. Anyway, that's what I did. I worked as an environmental chemist uh, for several years before I started teaching. And, um, holy crap, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, man, we got the most teacher today. Um, but you can, you can take a water sample and filter it through filter, a filter paper and then get forceps, take that filtered paper and put it in a petri dish with auger on it. And the auger is not just any auger, it's a special kind of auger. So that and then you incubate it overnight and you'll have little circular colonies of bacteria, right? Well, because of that auger, if there's a chemo, uh, fecal coliform bacteria on it, it will be a blue column. And it stands out like, it's just so obvious. So you count them. And then you know how many liter, milliliters of water you filter, and you can say, okay, well, there are five fecal coliforms per 100 mils of water. And that'll tell you whether or not it's good enough to drink in, to drink or, or you know, swim or fish in. One of the, uh, y'all will cover the Clean Water Act. <coughs> That's one of the other major laws, environmental laws you'll have to know. The, the overall goal, this was a test question one year, the overall goal for the U.S. Clean Water Act was to make our waterways, like rivers and streams, fishable and swimmable. And there's a limit on how many fecal coliforms you can have. So what does it mean? If you find fecal coliforms present, that means that it's been contaminated with feces, right? That's where the fecal comes from. That doesn't mean that it's bad automatically, because not all fecal coliforms are harmful to humans, and not all pathogens. However, there might be so it's an indicator organism. If you find fecal coliforms, it means there's been feces contamination. There might be something bad in it, like the bad kind of E. coli. Okay. Sorry. I do I do that in class all the time, and nobody ever knows what. I'm doing. All right. Um, so oxygen demanding ways are the ones that I was just talking about. Oh, in addition to in addition to having. Uh, the, the eutrophication happening, that will cause um, the dissolved oxygen to go down. If you put sewage into the Tennessee River, that, that is food, your poop is food for bacteria. And they, as they're eating it, the oxygen will go down because they're going to consume the oxygen also. Those are all oxygen demanding wastes. A big dead algal bloom or half treated sewage. And I'm telling y'all, so I told y'all that I take my students to the drinking water and wastewater treatment plant. They, uh, the Madison City and Huntsville City treatment plants are right on the Tennessee River, right beside the Tennessee River. And so the, one of the biggest purposes of a wastewater or sewage treatment plant is to lower the 